on to part two of the induction uh, ceremony. So we are going to move forward with Wayne Richardson. Now this one was kind of changed on me at the last moment. Uh, it, it's a little tougher to read. It's a photocopy of a photocopy that's been enlarged. So <laughs> I'll do the best uh, that I can with this one here. Wayne was fondly nicknamed Snoop. And I think uh, a few people have referenced that already after his always uh, accompanying canine companion. Very skillful athlete in his early Hamiota youth. He emerged as a solid batter, versatile fielder, and an exceptional organizer of teams which he assembled, coached, and managed. Later on, he would umpire and sponsor teams as well. In the 1960s, he came to Portage La Prairie to play with the Dodgers, who later became the Canadians in the 70s. He was a very skilled shortstop, catcher, batted in the middle of the lineup, and was an all-star in the local Central Manitoba Fastball League. Those in sport know the importance of organizers, and Snoop was persistently organizing and rejuvenating baseball and softball teams with which he played, coached or managed. His Canadian teams were dominant in the CMFL and in rural tournaments in the 70s, and on one occasion he entered the Canadians in the Gladstone Fastball Tournament on a Saturday and put an entry in the tournament on Sunday and won both at the last minute. 1980, the Wayne's Inn Canadians played competitive slow pitch for one year, and with Wayne as the pitcher, they won the right to represent Manitoba and the Nationals in Moncton, New Brunswick. Snoop would then revise fast pitch softball and portage by rejuvenating the Dodgers in the early 80s. The Dodgers brought home top prize, four of eight senior men's tournaments that year, as well as defeating the Winnipeg Steel Kings in an all-out effort to qualify for nationals, they added several veteran players from Winnipeg. And this Dodger team won the Winnipeg Fastball League and Senior A Provincials representing Manitoba in Telford Mines, Quebec. They qualified for the playoffs, but they were eliminated by Saskatchewan. More typical to Wayne's style was to give young players a chance when it was difficult to establish the, or to crack the established rosters with other teams. For example, the 1972 CMFL champion Canadians had three pitchers and two catchers under the age of 22, and the 1981 Dodgers had seven starting positions with players under the age of 25. Wayne's dedication to softball is, as a restaurant owner, as a sponsor of many, many teams over the years, helped raise money to meet financial obligations. In 1986, Snoop would retire from softball. He was asked to sign on with the Portage Diamonds as their certified coach. He wasn't a fan of flying, but he was committed, so he accommodated the team by driving all the way to Prince Edward Island to help out at the national event. He was not only a high-level certified coach, but also a high-level certified umpire. He umpired the 1980 Senior A Canadian National Championships in Saskatoon and the 1981 Canada Summer Games in Thunder Bay. During those many years, Snoop maintained his trademark laugh and gentle sarcasm, which kept players focused and loose. One observer said he was dedicated, disciplined, and demanding, but always respectful of his players, the officials, and the opponents. He experienced softball from several different points of view, was a great promoter of the sport in Portage La Prairie during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and he was a credit to the game. Ladies and gentlemen, Wayne Richardson, represented by Candace and Marcus Robinson, Larry Dewis presenting the plaque. Okay. First, we'd like to mention how incredibly honored we are to accept this award. A special thanks to Brian Pallister and Bill Calder for the nomination. Fastball was such a big part of his life and definitely one of his passions. Just as important were all of his teammates, friends, and memories of those times. His love for the sport was just as strong as his love for all his teammates and his players. There was nothing but proud joy while telling us his stories and it was truly a highlight of his life. Many might not know 
but he kept his dedication to the sport and style alive after the years mentioned, just at a different level. I'd like to share we also both got to have him as our coach for, for quite a many years. They said he was disciplined and demanding. I have to agree. <laughs> but once again, he was the coach everyone remembers. Oh my goodness. Sorry. Mm. I lost the page. Sorry. He was the coach everyone remembers for his respect and kindness. He gave absolutely everyone a chance, and our teams always had the best windups. Again, thank you to the uh, nominees or who put my dad forward, and uh, he would have been very, very proud of this. And uh, to all the people who played with him and for him, uh, he, you know, who, people who would never forget about him. We we're very appreciative, me and my mom and family here. And uh, we'd be very like to thank you for, you know, recognizing him and putting his name forward for this. He would have been beyond humbled. Thank you. Wayne Richardson, ladies and gentlemen. Our next inductee is Terry Wallen. And after a successful baseball career, culminating at the age of 23, in a 1983 uh, event with the Canadian Junior Baseball Championships in Niagara Falls, he decided to switch to fastball, and he excelled. 1984, his Legion No. 2 Blues won the Manitoba Senior A Championships. In 1985, they won the Manitoba Intermediate A Championships in bronze at the Western Canadian Intermediate A Championships. 1989, the Winnipeg Penguins won the Manitoba Senior A Championships in silver at the Western Canadian Championships. He was a big part of the squad. And in 1990, the Manitoba Senior B Championships. In the early 90s, he was added to the roster of the Portage Phillies for play at the Canadian National Championships, where he was named All-Canadian infielder and selected for the All-Canadian Senior Men's Development Team. 1993-94, with the Saskatoon Rempel Brothers, the team won two successive provincial championships. And in the latter year, he was named All-Canadian infielder at the Senior A Nationals. 1995, playing with the Toronto Gators, his team won the Ontario Senior A Championships and the USA ISC World Championships. And playing with Team Canada, he won gold at the Pan Am Games in Argentina. 1996, his Gators won provincials and a silver at the Worlds, where he was named All-Canadian and All-World infielder. From 1997 to 2000, with Dector Pride of Illinois, he was named ISC All-World Infielder four times, won the ISC batting title once. In 2007-2008, he won two successive Western Canadian Championships with the Saskatoon Allied Denture Clinics. Good name for a baseball team. Highly skilled and uh, competitive player. He is significantly known for his respect of the game and for his teammates, opponents, umpires, and fans. Humble and graceful, and always putting the team first. He consistently made spectacular fielding plays, key hits, and drove in crucial runs. A great player and an exemplary man, Terry Wallen, ladies and gentlemen. Gord Woolley presenting the award. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'd just like you to, to join in me in, in congratulating the committee first uh, on organizing this event today. Uh, I think it's been truly first class from the minute we stepped through the doors today. So please join me in. You know, we play this sport 
because we love it. But at the end of the day, there's there's quite a few people that have to be there to support our dreams and how and, and how we move forward with wanting to excel in this sport. So I've, I've got a few people I'd like to thank today. Uh, there's quite a few teammates here, and, and I won't go through all of them, but um, the first people I'd like to thank are my family, uh, my wife, my two daughters, Stephanie and Kirsten, my stepson Harrison, who is not here today. He's starting a new job in Calgary, but uh, this is a selfish sport. Uh, we take a lot of time away from individuals during the summer to be able to live the dream. So uh, if it wasn't for your support, uh, I wouldn't be able to stand up here in front of you today. Um, my mother, thanks for joining in the celebration today. My brother Darcy and his wife Lori. Um, I wish my father was here today. I know he's looking out um, after us, but he would truly be, uh, uh, be clapping um, at the same time. There's two other people I like to recognize, and one uh, I just talked to a little while ago. Coming from baseball, where I think Rick Elias can appreciate this, as a hitter, the baseball goes down, and that's what you're trained to hit. In softball, the ball always goes up. So I'd like to recognize Cliff Bishop here today. Um, when I started playing fastball with the Legion Number no. 2 Blues, and Cliff was pitching with, uh, with, with the Winnipeg Internationals, he recognized that I was probably one of the terriblest hitters ever um, and would always throw me rise balls. He would start it at my waist, I'd miss it by two feet. He'd throw it at my, a little bit higher, and another foot, I'd miss it by two feet. And he'd throw it a little bit higher again, and I'd miss it by another two feet. So, and he'd kind of have this little smirk, you know, uh, when he was doing it. But at the end of the day, uh, that was a challenge. And uh, that drove me even harder to learn this game. So Cliff, thank you very much for uh, throwing me those rise balls that made me look like an idiot. And there's one other guy that uh, really uh, got me into the sport, and his name is Ralph Nesper. He is a true friend. He's a brother, he's a father, um, and he believed. Um, when Cliff was throwing me those rise balls and I was missing them like crazy, I never heard one negative comment come out of his mouth. Uh, and my teammates were probably thinking, who in the heck is this guy on this team and why is he here? But I always got encouragement from Ralph. And he was the one that put my name forward today and I appreciate that, um, but truly, this honor today is shared with Ralph. So Ralph, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Our next inductee is our final individual inductee tonight, Les Newman. Les is one of those administrators that becomes integral to an organization pretty much right after he becomes a member. He accepts responsibility with grace. He administrates with a quiet, thorough, and respectful authority. His colleagues talk of the joy it is to work with him, and he served in all kinds of capacities during his 40 years in softball. In the late 1970s, as president of the Metropolitan Fastball League, he orchestrated the amalgamation of three leagues into the Winnipeg Fastball League served the league as a board member from 1980 to 1984, and as president from 1985 to 1994. During those years, until the year 2000, he also served in various capacities with the Manitoba Softball Association, including as facilities chair, both at Charlie Krupp Stadium and at the John Bloomberg Softball uh, Complex. Les was a driving force behind the development of that Bloomberg complex. In 1987-88, he served as president of the Manitoba Softball Association, 88-89 and 92-93 as a member of the Manitoba Softball's financial committee. 1988-94, he was Manitoba Softball fast pitch director. He often delegated to serve at provincials, the westerns and nationals, 
In 1999, Softball Manitoba awarded him the Jim Adams Award as Outstanding Administrator, Builder, or Executive Member. For many years, he served as board member of the Western Canada Softball Association and was a frequent voting delegate at many Softball Canada meetings. In 2006, he became a board member of the Manitoba Softball Hall of Fame and Museum Incorporated. Here he served as the treasurer since 2007. In 2012, he served as vice president of the Manitoba Slow Pitch League and in 2014 as president, position that he still holds. Less as an organizer, every organization would welcome and appreciate. He accepts numerous tasks, which he executes with care, precision, and passion. And when all seems done, he's the first to ask if he can do more. Though he's known primarily for his administrative work, he's enjoyed playing fastball for many years and still enjoys playing slow pitch. A remarkable man whose fostering care has helped grow and refine the game in our province, inspired many to serve more, and reinforced the belief that the game of softball enriches life and living. Les Newman, ladies and gentlemen, the award given to him by Al Sharp. Thank you everyone. Uh, I'm very honored to be inducted into the Hall of Fame and like to express my thanks to Penny and Brian for the nomination and to Evelyn Holinsky and Barb Smith for their letters of reference. I'm sure they helped. Um, and I want a hearty congratulations to all the other inductees tonight. My start with softball Manitoba was uh, in the early 70s when I was president of the Metropolitan Fastball League. Uh, there was lots of fighting amongst the leagues back in those days to vying for positions or time slots at Charlie Krupp Stadium, which was then the prime diamond to play on. Of course, I did some complaining to the Softball Manitoba administrators and got the old, well, if you want to do something about it, get on the board. So I got on the board and I haven't looked back since. I was many years on the board and then now with the Hall of Fame, so. Uh, over the years, it's been, I've been to many places that I never would have been to because of ball, and I've met many people and became very good friends, and still friends because of ball, so. I played the game of fast pitch for a few years, many years, and, and then I coached a ladies slow pitch team, and uh, before I joined the playing of the slow pitch, in the ranks of slow pitch. I still play ball two to six games a week during the season, and believe it or not, I'm one of the youngest guys on the team. So partic my participation in softball as a volunteer and as a member gave me the opportunity to travel and, and, like I said, to make many friends that are still friends, lifetime friends, and I believe that softball is a sport for life because all the guys are way older than I am that are still playing with me. So. And I hope to have many more years of involvement in, in the sport, in any capacity. Thanks very much, and I hope everybody enjoys the evening. Thank you very much, Les. Our final uh, induction tonight is in the team category, and much like the last team, we will read the uh, bio, have a few words shared about the team, and then we will introduce the players and their representatives uh, one at a time. The 1986 Portage Diamonds fastball team. Now following 1985, the fastball season in 1985, Brian Pallister expressed interest in reviving senior A fastball in Portage La Prairie. So he went to Larry Dewis and convinced him the thing to do was to get together a solid group of local players, some volunteers, because you always need those, and also find some support from the community, which was great for the Portage Diamonds. So they were founded in 1986, not really sure what was going to happen. The first season exceeded their expectations because they won the Winnipeg Fastball League's A division and the playoffs by defeating the favored Winnipeg Internationals in the final. 
The Diamonds were also victorious at Provincials. Steinbach beating the Internationals. Steinbach K.K. Penner and the Minto Mustangs twice to win the right to represent Manitoba at the Senior A Nationals in Summerside, Prince Edward Island. Now the team was comprised of all local players with the exception of pitcher hitter Rick McKay, formerly of McKay United fastball team. Ferdy Nielsen, due to the team need, was converted to become a catcher, and he was pretty solid in that role. The return of Daryl Henry added a slugger in the middle of the lineup, combined with the confident play and versatility of the other teammates, provided a lot of success. But one of the biggest factors was the veteran Brian Pallister, one of the premier pitchers in the province. Yes. None of this happens without him. At Nationals, the Diamonds bolstered their squad with pickups from the Winnipeg Internationals in Cliff Bishop, Randy Dutame, and Dale Wilson. The Diamonds started off slowly, but they finished in a four-way tiebreaker where they would beat Quebec 2-1 and Prince Edward Island 3-0 to advance to the playoffs before losing 1-0 to Nova Scotia, which was led by a national team pitcher Mark Smith. The Portage Diamonds team would then carry on for nine seasons, providing many different players the opportunity to compete at the top level of fast, uh, fast pitch softball right here in Portage. The 1986 Diamonds planted that seed and it blossomed from there. Representing the 1986 Portage Diamonds fast pitch team, the award given to them by Les Elchuk, Brian Pallister, and Larry Dewis. Last on the docket, but that's okay. Want that mic lower? <laughs> <laughs> like I'm about to say, we're last on the docket, but that's okay. I'm actually excited to be speaking to you tonight, but normally I don't get to talk much when I'm around Brian. <laughs> His mind is always in overdrive, and he's so passionate about what he does, he, he just gets going. Consequently, it's a lot of head nodding and, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I think pitchers should hit more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A.V. Stubbington Ferdy, is a good Ferdy, hitter. Ferdy already had to put up with this stuff, didn't he, enough? Can I continue? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Get to the good point. Yeah, yeah, A.V. Stubbington is a good hitter. Yeah, yeah, I know, know him. Oh, you owned him, right? Ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. It's hard to break into that one-sided conversation, but Ferdy can do it. He just crashes through a couple decibels higher, and then he's off to the races too. Because guess what? He's passionate about what he does as well. I'm joking right now, but my point is, every team needs committed people like this who eat, breathe, and sleep softball in the summer to create the culture required to compete at the top level. Before we get started on the 86 Diamonds, thanks goes to the executive of the Manitoba Softball Hall of Fame and Museum, both past and present. I've seen what is done firsthand and respect the fact the history of softball is being preserved. Thanks also to everyone here for supporting this event, especially those coming from out of province. Lots of familiar faces I don't get to see often enough. A couple former junior colonel teammates are here, Ralph Nesper, and P.K. Peter Clausen. We went to university together. Oh, you never went to university. <laughs> <laughs> I say we went to university, but actually in 1973, our first year in nationals in Ottawa, they put us up in the dorms at the university for a week. <laughs> So every job application af thereafter, when it came to the question post-secondary education, I ticked it off, damn right, it's Carleton University. <laughs> the 86 Diamonds, I'd like to give you a rundown on each and every player because they all have a story over there. But time won't allow that. Instead, I will summarize how this group came together. Give thanks, touch on the end result, and Pally will bring it home with comments of his own. 
Basically, Brian expressed a strong desire to pitch ball in his hometown to pick up where the 81-82 Dodgers left off, more like the 81 team when the majority of the players were local. When we committed to that idea, the word got out and Rick McKay from McKay United contacted us needing a place to play. It was a good fit for us. As we all know, you need good pitching to win, and one wasn't enough. Next, we had to look at options behind the plate. And as we spoke of before, Ferdy seemed like the logical choice to me. He thought the game well enough, he was gritty enough, and he threw well. Fortunately, he accepted the challenge. He still curses me to this day for making him do that, but I know he realized that move enhanced his career. Then there's the hitting issue. That was a big pro question mark as three quarters of the team were new to this caliber of ball, and we had to face guys like Bishop, Banman, Bouchard, Nicholson, Workman and T-Bone. It's an ongoing process to adapt to this caliber of pitching. Some players that are good at intermediate ball never do. It depends on how good you are to begin with and how much time you're willing to put in in order to improve. Defensively, our guys could make plays and these guys are versatile, many playing out of position throughout the season to fill a need. They were a confident group who had success in ball or hockey or both growing up, so they knew what it took to win and we're up for the challenge. It went better than we could have imagined, especially considering the Winnipeg Internationals were in the way of where we wanted to go. How many pages you got? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. 62 pages to go. <laughs> I gotta beat Ferdy by 30 seconds. <laughs> we didn't dominate, but Pally and Ricky always gave us a chance to win, and we found a way to get it done. I remember that surreal feeling at Provincials and Steinbeck after the final out. Holy man, it really happened. And the next thought, after finding the beer cooler, of course, was how are we going to come up with the 22 grand needed to get to PEI? That is where our great supporting cast comes in. I literally fell into the role of field manager when I re-injured my ACL during indoor training. So I approached my buddy Garth Asham to assist with the coaching duties, and we surrounded ourselves with a great team of volunteers and supporters that include Tricky Dicky Laframbois, I credit Tricky for getting McKay signed. I may have been too rigid to get that done. Jean Spiller and her daughter Colleen were always willing to lend a helping hand. The late Bill Henry was a fixture at the game, scoring and announcing. Can't forget about the media, Marilyn from CFRY and the legendary Mo Cartman from the Daily Graphic, who gave us lots of exposure, which kept the interest level high. Speaking of Mo, I've got to tell you this one story. It's my 50th birthday, and my wife, Bev, thinks it's a good idea to have me roasted at a fundraiser for the new softball diamond at Republic Park. It was supposed to be a secret, but Alvin Ogilvy spilt the beans. <laughs> Bev lines up some so-called friends for, to take part in this roast, several who are here tonight, one being the premier. For those of you who didn't know Mo, he was a longtime sports writer who came across gruff because he was gruff. Like everyone else, he wasn't totally free of fault. It was common knowledge he picked his favorites. Among these were the Graham family, the Calders, the Blights, Shane Moffat was a frequent flyer in Mo's mumblings, and so was the Dewis family. So it's this guy's turn to roast me. He must have been harboring some long time resentment about us getting ink and him not so much because he couldn't wait to get this snide remark out. Bish, I need a drum roll for this one because it's classic. Brian says, Larry Dewis's nose was so far up Mo Cartman's ass that he could see Brian Graham's feet. <laughs> Got one good line. <laughs> the 86 Diamonds even had a team doctor. Regular teams don't have team doctors. Regular teams are lucky to have a first aid kit. We had a team doctor, Dr. Jim Price. Unfortunately, we kept him busy that season from start to finish with off-field stuff too. I can't remember who it was. 
I'm going to go with Harvey Sanderson. <laughs> Harvey goes to uh, Dr. Price's office complaining about a pain in his side, and Jim knows Harvey well, so he pokes him a few times and, and says, Harvey, I'm not sure what the problem is. It's alcohol-related. <laughs> so Harvey has a puzzled look on his face and says, That's okay, Doc. I'll come back tomorrow when you're sober. Pally was in charge of scheduling, so in typical fashion, it was aggressive. Here's where we give thanks. Thanks to our wives and families for their support, it was a big commitment. Thanks to the business community, who we called upon twice in that first season. Without you, it doesn't happen. It was this year I realized the importance of supporting those who support you. Shop local. Thanks to the loyal fans, it's always more fun playing in front of a crowd. Thanks to the pickups who helped us qualify for playoffs at Nationals, Cliff Bishop, Randy Dutane, and the late Dale Wilson. Thanks to the late Snoop Richardson and Bill Henry who drove all the way to Summerside, PEI, to support us. Thanks to Gordy Stinson, Angus Moore, Perry, and Rodney Dickinson for having the confidence in themselves to spare for us in the final league playoff game when they hadn't played all season. I told you we had a lot of injuries. I've got to give thanks to, to these guys over here. I've got this vision etched in my mind about me with my head in a scorebook mulling over lineups, and I would look up occasionally to see some of these guys playing pepper or catch with my four-year-old. It's things like that which sparks interest, and he's still playing fastball today, 31 years later. The on-field success was sweet, but the most significant accomplishment in that 86 season, when Pallet brought his long right arm home to pitch, was it paved the way for many diamond teams to come. And the trickle-down effect to that is the pesky Portage Phillies. If you sum it all up, that's about two and a half decades and counting of fond fastball memories and good times. I want to say thanks to Larry Pettinger, is the only guy that Larry left out there. Larry, thanks for being here, Larry. Um, there's a lot of stories, so I'll just tell one. 30 years ago this weekend, um, I brought in uh, a team from Saskatoon to play these guys. And uh, they were the automatic A's. Uh, they were a national level team, they were tough, and they had a pitcher named Gene McWillie. Gene McWillie had crushed the jaw of Ronnie Gustafson uh, in five places the year before, and unfortunately our guys all knew about that. And as they watched him warm up over at Island Park over here, uh, their jaws were kind of dropping, and they were a little slack. I think they were a wee bit intimidated because this guy uh, well, he could really bring it. He was uh, timed at the World Championships three years in a row before that, and he, was, he had the most velocity of everybody there. So as he warmed up, it was a grunt and whack, grunt and whack like that. In the first inning, he got everybody out uh, nine pitches, as I recall. So I knew uh, that I had to set an example for these less experienced guys, so the I let off the second inning, and I dug in, uh, watched the warm-up, had a time pretty good. I thought, I, I can square this guy up. And uh, I stepped in the batter's box. It was a good crowd, too. It was packed. It was really fun. And I, uh, I focused hard on that right hip, and I knew I watched him. I knew where that ball was coming. I was trying to pick his pitches, but I knew I could square it up. And he let a grunt go, and he threw that first pitch, and I didn't see it. Strike! Like this. The ump yells. And uh, I had to save face. I was humiliated. I did not see that ball. Honest to God, and I played some pretty good ball. So I turned and I did what every self respecting ball player does when they're shamed. I blamed the umpire. <laughs> and, I, and I said, What do you mean, strike? And Donnie Middleton, rest his soul, was the umpire. And a lot of you guys know Donnie. And. Uh, You've seen that Norman Rockwell pitcher uh, with, the pit, with the batter and the umpire, and the batter's a lot taller than 
the umpire, and they're talking, they're having an intelligent discussion. We weren't that picture, because this wasn't an intelligent discussion. I stepped back from the batter's box. Donnie pulled back from his position. He slid his mask up like this, and I'm huffing and puffing mad, and he looked right at me, and he said, sounded like a strike to me. He didn't see it either, and <laughs> so that was the two of us. Over the years, we brought teams from the heartland to Porters La Prairie to play. We brought the, some of the best teams in the world to play. The way to get better in anything is to go up against the best you can possibly find, and we had the chance to do that here in Porters La Prairie when fastball was in its prime. To see the legacy of that gives all of us who love the sport great pride. I'm very, very proud of all the people who've been inducted tonight. I'd like us to put our hands together for them and, and for the, the successful teams here tonight. <laughs> Larry's lengthy comments uh, left out one very important uh, thing. And what, the, what it left out was something that is tremendously important uh, to the Portage Diamonds, because the Portage Diamonds would not have happened without Larry Dewis. And it's Larry Dewis that deserves the, the recognition. Wherever you are. I am tremendously proud of the people in this sport and people in this room, the people around our province and country that play team sports, support them, sponsor them, coach them, and lead. I'm proud of the guys I had a chance to play with on this squad, not just because of the athletes they were, but because of the men they have been over the 30 years since we played together. There's not a person in that group that hasn't given back in some way, hasn't given back as a coach or as a teacher or as a mentor to somebody else, and that's what this sport gives us gives us the chance to do that, and we've done it, and I'm proud of that, and I thank you for the honor of having a chance to address you tonight. Whew, it's a little high, that microphone. Now introduce the members of the 1986 Diamonds, and uh, much like the club before they can come up on stage and then we'll have a quick opportunity for a photo after that. Assistant coach Garth Asham. Already on stage the field manager Larry Dewis. Scott Dewis. Darren Frank. Watching his son in the WHL final uh, not here tonight Daryl Henry represented by Melora Smoke. Alan Martin, representing Rick McKay, Don Smoke. Dean Moxham, Ferdy Nelson, Brian Pallister, Gary Palmer, Stan Radomski, Harvey Sanderson, Jeff Singh, Gary Single, not here tonight, as one of the most successful junior hockey coaches in Canada, Blake Spiller, represented by nephew Dylan Roman. <laughs> Representing Dick Laframboise, Alvin Ogilvie. Team Doctor, Jim Price. And Secretary Treasurer, Gene Spiller. 1986, Portage Diamonds, ladies and gentlemen. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, as you maybe gather over there to take pictures, there is no hurry to leave. Certainly you could stay around, reminisce, and share a few stories. But this does conclude our formal ceremonies for the evening.
Thank you to all of our special guests. For anybody that had auction tickets, the numbers are posted, the winning numbers are posted on the board, so please go check them. Congratulations to each one of the inductees. Thank you for being with us here this evening. And remember to check those auction numbers, drive safely. Good night, everybody, and thank you for coming out.